You ever feel like when you're raising your kids, you just, oh, I wish I'd done that different, or oh, I shouldn't have told them to do that, or you know, you know. But but God, He He inspires us to be great. That's what He wants. Um, when I was a kid, first of all, I loved football. Anybody else? Anybody else in here love football when you're a kid? Okay. Second of all, how many of you played slow motion football? You know, where you run across the living room and dive on the chair? Did you know that? You just... <laughs> over and over and over again. And there was always two seconds left in the game to win the game. I mean, that's just, that's what, how many of y'all played soldiers out in the front yard and the cars coming by, the headlights were guns? Anybody else? The cars are coming by, and we're shooting at them, and they're shooting at us, and, and you get, shoot like, get shot like 30 times, and you get up and take out the bat. The, the, you know, that's just, that, that's just who we are, because that's what you do when you're kids. How many of you played G.I. Joes? How many of you G.I. Joe had Barbie for a girlfriend? <laughs> when you have a sister, you can have a Barbie for a girlfriend for you, because I didn't own no Barbies. So what happens to us? Why do we go from kids thinking we can do anything in our slow motion mind to always wishing we'd done a little better, always wishing we'd taken another step? If I'd only just gone to college, if I'd only just taken that promotion, if, if I hadn't said that to my boss, if, 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 if I had different moms and dads, all of those things are things that we, we struggle with because when we're kids, we, we just learn to adjust to everything around us and, and be the guest in our, best in our minds that we can possibly be. But then as we grow and, and go through life, I've met so many grown-ups just feel like I'm just doing the best I can. Just doing the best I can. And when you say I'm just doing the best I can, that means you don't think you can do better. But let me make you a promise. No matter what you do for a living or not living or, or whatever, whatever is going on in your life, I can just promise you something right now because this isn't my promise. This is God's promise. You can be greater than you are now. You know, you don't have to lead a company. You don't, you just, you just got to be God's kid. And God gives us the stuff that his kid needs to be our best. And a lot of us are wasting what God offers us. And I'm not, it might be running a company, but it might be leading other people to the Lord. It might be being the best neighbor you can possibly be. It might be that person that everybody goes, what a nice guy. We got to find out what makes him tick. And then you can tell them, you know, I once was this, but now because of Jesus, I'm that. That's, that's greatness. Anything you can do that helps people change their lives, it's greatness. One of the things we have to be careful of is God is not opposed to greatness. He's opposed to what? Pride. Pride. He's opposed to pride. God is not opposed to greatness. He's opposed to pride. God wants us to be great. He wants us to be strong. He wants us to be unwavering. He wants us to be good leaders. Some of you are going, oh, I'm not a leader. You know what a leader, you know what the definition of a leader is? Someone who influences somebody. You can be a bad leader and influence them a bad way, or you can be a bad leader and not influence them like you should, or you can be a good leader and you're influencing people to be the best they can by the way you do the things that you do. He wants us to be strong heads of our families, realizing that strength comes from God and praising God empowers us. We're the kids. He wants what's best for his kids. He knows what's best for our kids. And, and he's, he's constantly trying to get inside of us for us to know what's best for us. Not from what the world says, but from what he says. Greatness is maximizing your potential for the glory of God and the good of others. Let me say that again. 
Greatness is maximizing your potential for the glory of God and the good of others. Greatness to God is a matter of the heart. Greatness to God is a matter of the heart. Now, we're going to talk some about King David. And for those of you who don't know anything about King David, uh, he's the Old Testament. Uh, God chose him to be king of the Israelites and uh, when he was a little guy. And I'm going to read you some of his story, and, and, and you're going to see— uh, you're going to find out that David's somebody that you would want to be. You may not lead a kingdom, but you're going to be leading whoever you're influencing. In 1 Samuel 16, 6, Samuel has been, Samuel's a prophet. So God has, the Israelites don't have a, don't have a king leading them. They had one of God's people. Now, that, that would make sense, right? I mean, it would make sense that God's people who are, who are being attacked from every way, that, that they would be led by God, and who else would lead them? God wouldn't come down here and be in all of his power leading them, but his prophets, they were the ones who spoke for him. They're the ones that wrote, wrote for him. And, and Samuel is the one who's, who's leading them at this time, and the, and the people are not really happy about it because they want a king. They want a king. And God decided, all right, I'm going to let you make your own decision. So he, he parades this guy named Saul before the people and appoints him as God. I mean, as, as king. Now, the interesting thing is he's not a follower of God. So he does things the way the world wants to do things. Why did they pick him? Because he was the biggest, the prettiest, the tallest, the strongest, the best arrow shooter, the best whatever. That's how he got chose. That's how he got chose. And he just screwed up, I hate to say this, royally. <laughs> he was a really bad king. Because God wanted to, just like any dad would, say, I told you so, I told you so. So when so now God tells Samuel, I want you to go, I want you to go pick a king. And he's sending him to Bethlehem to pick a king, and he's walking there. And it's interesting as you read the story. It's in first, it's in first Samuel, if you want to go in and look at that, but I'm just gonna give you give you little pieces of it. But he but he sends he, he sends the prophet. Now, when you're a prophet back in those days that represents God, when you walk into a group of Israelites, they're like going, what the heck is he doing here? It's like the judge has come, you know? So they weren't, weren't happy to see him. But, but God said, look, I want you to go there, and, and I, want you to, I want you to pick my guy. So in 1 Samuel 16, 6, it says, When they arrived in Bethlehem, Samuel took one look at Eliab, who was a son of, in this family, and he said, Surely this is the Lord's anointed. And, and, and his own... Samuel, the prophet himself, who follows God, the way he decided that Eliab was the perfect king was we were back to his size again and his strength. And, and he looks like a leader, and, and that's just the way it is. But look, verse 7, God says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't judge by his appearance, his height, for I have rejected him. Don't, don't judge. He's going... Don't judge like the people judge. I want you to judge the way I judge. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Isn't that interesting? I'm a really emotional guy. I just really am. I don't get angry like I used to because I, because I've learned. Here's here's something I learned. I'm gonna. I'm, this is. I'm throwing this in as a bonus. You ready? This is bonus. You might wanna. You might wanna write it down. Um, I've developed an attitude of forgiveness. If I'm driving down the street, and somebody's driving like a jack wagon. 
It doesn't bother me. Now, don't look at me like, you yeah, know, it doesn't bother me. No, no, I've sat beside you guys. <laughs> and I have a wife that gets a little bit tense if a guy's going 36 in a 55. But it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me. It's an attitude of forgiveness. And one of the best things we can do as Christians is develop an attitude to forgive somebody before they do something to offend us. And it'll just become a part of what you do. You'll just, I can, I'm not saying people don't get under my skin sometimes, but, but that's, just, that, that's, what, that's, just, that's just what we need to learn to do. So God chose David. In the world's eyes, he was an unlikely candidate. He was, he was small in stature. He was the youngest of the family, but he's also the one who killed who? Goliath. I mean, he shows up. If you don't know about David and Goliath, uh, not the TV show we used to watch before church on Sundays. If, if you're, uh, Goliath showed up and all the Israelites are up here, just all of them, and they're going, somebody go get him. And, and Goliath's out there going, ah, 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 ah. You know, it's just like, just, just Goliath. And, and David comes running up, and, and he comes to Saul, who's still the king at that point, and he tells Saul, I can take him out. I kill lions, and I take care of my sheep, and I, I, I can take out Goliath. So, again, uh, Saul's looking at David the way people look at David, and he says, you need a suit of armor. He didn't say... No, don't go do it. He said, you need a suit of armor. So he puts his armor on him. So David, who's five feet tall, is wearing Saul, six foot five's uniform. Uh, what do you call him? Not uniform. Your armor. So, he's, so he says, I can't do so Anyway, dude, he goes out and kills him. He just goes out, he just, just like what he does when he's, when he's messing around, he, he, can hit a, he can hit a bird off a rock, he can, he can do that, and he takes out Goliath. And the people are starting to notice something about David. Acts 13, 22 says what happens to Saul. God removed him from kingship and replaced him with David. A man about whom God said, David, son of Jesse, is a man after my own heart, for he will do everything I want him to do. What if, what if that, what if you lived such a great life that we put that on your tombstone? Huh? Rick was such an amazing person who followed after God, did everything that he wanted him to. He, he, how awesome would that be? You would know just, you would know just from reading his tombstone that, that he's different than other people. God wants us to be different from other people. Ladies, I'm not just talking to the guys here. God wants us to represent him well. And, and the way we know that we're great is that, that we do the best that we can possibly be. We have a heart for God. And when good things happen, we give the glory to God. Now, you watch. Have you noticed how many Christian quarterbacks there are right now in the NFL? And, like, it, it's, it's weird because it used to be really rare that a that a you know, except for Roger Staubach, who threw the Hail Mary, there used to not be guys that, that did that kind of stuff. But these guys now, they, they stand up and they have this platform and, and they represent God and say, you know what? I'm giving God the glory. I'm giving God the glory for the things that he does. What if you did that? What if that's the way you lived your life? What if you just woke up every single morning and just decided, Lord, I'm living for you today. Now, I want to promise you, I will promise you this. It won't always be pretty. Because there's something we all have to go through to get stronger. You know what they are? Trials. We have to go through trials to make us stronger. 
And the more we go through those trials, if we recognize and give God the glory for the good things, we've also got to thank God and give God the glory for the hard things that happen in our life. Because we can know, oh, this is, this is not a good thing. This is a terrible thing. This is happening to me. But God, I give you the glory because I know you're going to use this for your glory. How about that? Is that something that you do? Do you aspire to do that? Do you wake up in the morning and go, okay, God, I'm going, I'm, I'm, I'm going to work today and I'm going to represent you. And you know what ends up happening? Because it happened to me. I'm in my mid-20s. For the first time in my life, I make this serious commitment to God. I go to work at Texas Power and Light. My employees who were friends of mine were kind of making fun of my faith. But the more I did what God wanted, the more the other people I worked with noticed the difference in my life. And God used me to make a difference in their life. What if instead of that guy at work that you hate, and the reason is, is because you haven't developed an attitude of forgiveness. What if you decide that that guy that you hate and nobody else likes there, that you're going to start praying about him and ask God how to make a difference in this guy's life? I would love to challenge y'all to do that. I would love to know how it goes. Nothing, nothing makes me more excited than to hear you guys tell me your stories and, and, and how God uses you to change things. But, but as you look at things in life, you've got to decide, what, what do you do under stress? What do you do when you mess up and you sin? How do you come back from that? And what is you, what in your heart, what if, how do you respond when you are successful? Are you responding by somebody who's giving glory to God or just a person who's going around being the best you can possibly be as a person? God made David great because David had what? The right heart. That's what God's seeking for. So I'm about to give you five, I think, five conditions of a great heart. So this is important. Listen to this. You might look at it over and over again. You might wake up in the morning and you might go, you know, here, I'll just tell you, these five, is it five? How many did I put on there? These five things, if you wake up in the morning and you pray those out and then you stick with them during the day, you carry a little card with you and when things go wrong or when you get to the office or when you're going to do, you pray through those things, I can promise you a change. But I can also promise you'll get challenged. And that's when you decide whether you pass the trial or not, is when you get challenged. So let's look at conditions of a great heart. Conditions of a great heart. A heart that trusts God. A heart that trusts God. You have to have a heart that trusts God when you lose your job. You have to have a heart to trust God when, when you realize your husband is cheating on you. You have to have a heart that trusts God so that you can respond in ways that God wants you to. And you can, when you trust, here's what you know when you trust. You know that God loves you and he wants to make something out of this that's going to make you stronger. You know, as parents, we do the best we can in our own messed up crooked way for our, to help our kids be the best they can possibly be. But I can promise you, how many of y'all have screwed up at least once or twice in things you told your kids to do or didn't do or treated them a certain way or, or whatever? We just, we just do that. And, and that's part of the trials too. Some of the trials that come to us come directly from the things that, that we do. I wrote this. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is moving in spite of your fear. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is moving in spite of your fear because you trust God. You can do that because you trust God. You can be a nut and just do all kinds of crazy things, jumping off motorcycles and whatever else you do. And, but, but, but if you know and you can trust God, you're going to do things the way God wants you to. And, and that's a challenge. It's always a challenge. David wrote, my health may fail and my spirit may grow what? Even David. Now we know David's spirit grew weak because he screwed up quite a few times himself. My health may fail, but my spirit may grow weak. 
but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. He is mine forever. Wow, these are great. These are great prayers. These are great things to write down and, and just use every once in a while and, and when you need them just to encourage yourself. Psalm 116.10, I believe in you, so I prayed. I am deeply troubled, Lord. How many of y'all this week went to God and said, God, I just really need help with this. I'm, I'm just deeply troubled. We all, we all do that. And that ought to be your natural thing. When, when you feel trouble come on, when you come anxiety come on, when you, when you feel something's going wrong, you ought to automatically reconnect to the Lord, and He'll help you get through that, and that will be a trial that will help you be stronger. Psalm 118, in my distress, again, this is David, I prayed to the Lord, and the Lord answered me and rescued me. The Lord is for me, so I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Well, they can kill you. Anybody had been killed? Anybody been killed by another mortal? If you raise your hand, there's something wrong with you. No, if you, you know, it's, mortals, mortals are mean. They say bad things. They screw things up for you. All these, all these things happen. But when you're a person who trusts God, in my distress, I prayed to the Lord, and the Lord answered me and rescued me. The Lord is for me, so I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? He's talking spiritual realm here. Sometimes when we get hurt, when we're struggling— other people are affected in a positive way. And that's a cool thing, too. When you start thinking about the spiritual world, you have no idea who at your office is watching you. And I want you to promise me something. If you don't act like a Christian, don't tell people you are. Just don't. Don't make a big deal out of it. I've worked with guys who had a Bible that thick on their desk. They did the least work of anybody, and we all had to do their work to catch them up. Please put that Bible away. Take it home. And then when you learn to do it, you can come back and do it. Your boss should think you're the best employee he's got. He can trust you. He knows you can take care of business. Don't be the, don't be the person that people are going that Christian. Christians are just, they're just sorry. They're just, they think because they know God, they just, you know, just don't be that person. Don't be that person. Be the person that God wants you to be or don't tell people you are a Christian. Pray, trust, and keep going. We've got to trust God. We've got to trust God. A servant's heart. David had a servant's heart. Now, Meekness is a word that we think of as weak. We even think of humble as being weak. But, but, but the strength in meekness, the, the, the thing about being meek is putting God before our eyes at all times. I'm going to make my decisions not on, based on my own thoughts and the things I want to do, but on the things that God wants me to do. Look what Psalm 119 says. Again, David, I have tried my best to find you. Don't let me wander from your commands. So if this is your prayer, let's just say you decided this week, I'm going to pray this every week, every day. I have tried my best to find you, Lord. Don't let me wander from your commands. So what do you think you need to be doing during the week to be able to do this? Know the commands, right? You got to know the commands. And, and if you're sitting in your day and you've never really been a big Bible reader, maybe you're new to Christianity, maybe you're at church for the first time, uh, can I just tell you something? Don't start with Genesis. Because Leviticus comes pretty close right after that. If you're, if you're going, okay, roll, where do I start? First of all, King James versions are nice. We say the Lord's Prayer in the King James Version. But get a New Living Translation. It's a great translation. It speaks in regular English. Uh, it wasn't written in the 1300s. So it's important that we, that we, that we do that. And then just start, don't go, don't go, I got to read 30 pages a day. No, read a few verses. 
and then pray about it. Get your little journal out. I do these um, devotionals every day. They're, they're just little one-minute devotionals, and I do that from my devotional on, on Instagram and stuff. I, I, I study a couple of verses, and, and I write something out, and I pray that, and then I turn that in, into a devotional. It doesn't take very much time at all. And then when you do have more time to do things, here's the way you really learn God's commands is if you do it instead of just reading it. If you don't know what it's like to forgive somebody who's hurt you badly, then guess what? You don't know what it's like to forgive someone who's hurt you badly. One of the greatest things I, that people deal with all the time is being able to let go of something. Again, that developing that attitude, that attitude of forgiveness. Reassure me of your promise, Lord, which is for, which is for those who what? honor you. Why doesn't God do this for me? Because you're being, a, you're being a disrespectful, disobedient kid right now. You know, it's time out time. And, you know, we've done, we did time out. I found spankings worked better for me than time out. But, but that's what God, God's going to discipline you if you're not doing the things that he tells you to do. And in different ways. I mean, who knows? It, that's just, but reassure me of your promises, which, which is for those who honor you, Lord. Now, I love this. Now, Moses, well, first of all, everybody familiar with Charlton Heston playing Moses? Well, Charlton Heston had to play Moses because no one else was strong. Now, if Dwayne was around back then, he, maybe he could have played Moses. I don't think so. But, but not like Charlton Heston. And, but because Charlton Heston... Charlton Heston was strong and he was brave. Charlton Heston was actually raised up with the Egyptians. And he was next in line to be king. But what he did was he left and he went to follow God. He got called to go follow God. Now watch this. Now Moses was very humble more humble than any other person on earth. Boy, how would you like that on your tombstone? Moses was very humble, more humble than any other person on earth. God humbled Moses to make Moses great. God took Moses, who had been brought up in the best schools. He's been brought up to, to become Pharaoh. He's, 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 he's this person God throws him out in the wilderness. You know what he did for 40 years? Herded sheep. Herded sheep. And he got so humble that when it was time for God to send somebody to Pharaoh, he came to Moses and said, hey, you got to go talk to Pharaoh. And Mo Moses, who used to be a not-so-humble person, said, gosh, God, couldn't you send my brother? Isn't that crazy? Couldn't you send my brother? I mean, he, was, he, just, he just didn't think he could do it. But then God empowered him to do that. And then Moses became Moses. And, and it was a perfect role for Charlton Heston to play then. A humble heart. Moses, I mean Moses, David had a humble heart. God wants you to be a success, but he wants you to give God all the glory. Proverbs 16, 5 says, the Lord despises pride. Be assured that the proud will be punished. Be assured that the proud will be punished. 1 Samuel 18, 14, David continued to succeed in everything he did for the Lord was with him. Okay, now, this is what you do when you're looking at Scripture. You look at the Scripture. You don't just go, okay, David, see, if you're, if you're going, I got to read 10 pages today, you'll go, da -da 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 -da. David, and you won't even notice what that is right there. This is one of those you stop at and go, David continued to succeed in everything he did because the Lord was with him. So, so how do you follow that up with a prayer? Lord, please be with me today all day. And then when you're driving to work, you go, Lord, please be with me all day today. And then when you get to the office, you go, Lord, 
please be with me all day today. And then you get to thinking, he is with me. I just have to remember he's there. So the prayer needs to be, Lord, would you please help me remember you were there? Would you let me see you working in these people's lives at work? Would, would you show me how you're working around me? See what I'm saying? That's what you do when you study the Bible. It's not a speed reading course. It's God's word. And here's the cool thing. You might read this today, and then six months from now, you happen to come past it again, and all of a sudden, you will see something different in this one sentence that you did before. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit teaches you and, and puts it to wherever you're at with whatever's going on in your life at the moment. But success, success needs to be, we need to realize that success comes to us from God. Psalm 115, 1. Not to us, O Lord, but to you goes all the glory for your unfailing love and faithfulness. Again, look, if you want to find prayers in Scripture, go to the Psalms. It's all prayers. So what is, what's, so what's the writer here saying? O Lord, but to you goes all the glory for your unfailing love and faithfulness. Hang on to that. All you got to do is take that sentence and pray that all day long. It's going to make a difference. It's going to make a difference in your heart. It's going to make a difference in the things that you see. It's going to make a difference in the way you respond. It's going gonna, it's gonna to change you. It's going to change you. The next thing is a repentant heart. A repentant heart. David had a repentant heart. David was very messed up. David cheated. Uh, he, had, he had an affair. David, David goes up on the top. He's king. He, he's surrounded by people and he's king he goes up one day into his room he out on his balcony and he looks over and he goes naked lady at two o'clock now i know none of you guys in here would look you would immediately turn away and and no 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 most people would look at least twice but he became infatuated this is David, the guy who's close to God, the guy who God brags on all the time. This is David. The, he, the devil goes, this is going to tempt you. This is going to mess you up so bad that it's... But David has a repentant heart. He repented. Psalm 51.1, have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion. Blot out the stain of my sins. I'll tell you what. When you are, I would have to say what ended up happening with that last, with him looking out and seeing, I think he obsessed and he obsessed and he obsessed until he had blocked God off. Remember, God never leaves you. He's still there. But you can be messing around so much in your spirit that you don't even feel or you notice that God's there. So all that stuff's happening. So all that it takes is for you to get back to being sorry that you're doing the things that God doesn't want you to do. It's for you to get back close to God. And how's the best way to get back close to God? It's to get back in the Word of God. It's to get back on your knees. It's to be praying to God. God and asking him to lead you. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin, for I recognize my shameful deeds that haunt me day and night. The sacrifice you want is a broken spirit, a broken and repentant heart. Oh God, will you not despise? Next is a willing heart. If you're going to, if, if you're going to be, a, if you're going to be great. You've got to have a willing heart. You got to be willing to do the things. I'll just tell you, God asks us to do hard things. He really does. He, he does in his word and he does in our heart. He's going to ask you to be nice to that person. He's going to ask you to help that person out that never hurt, helps you. He's, he's going to ask you to do different things all the time because God wants you to lead them to him. That's our goal, right, as believers. You know that, right? I think we ought to look at our, as what we do for a living, and we ought to go, okay, how can I represent God well here? Can I just ask you a question? I'm, no raising of your hands or whatever, but when was the last time you invited somebody to come to church? When was the last time? 
There's people all around you. And what's weird is a lot of us don't even know the spiritual, uh, where people are spiritually that we're in office with because we don't even know the guy down there in the third cubicle is actually a Christian. And we don't know because he's not doing what a Christian's supposed to be. And we don't know because we're not doing what a Christian's supposed to be. Wouldn't it be cool if you knew two of you were Christians? And you talked about your church and, and you talked about your faith and you, on, on lunch break and, and you talked about people to pray for in your office. And I mean, it, it, that's life changing. God wants us to have a willing heart. Listen to Second Chronicles 16, 9. I love this. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth for what? In order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. God wants to strengthen you. He doesn't want you obeying him to weaken you. He wants it to strengthen you. He wants it to make you stronger. He wants it so that you can be the person who has a positive effect on other people. God is looking for people to use. It's a commitment that says, God, I'm not perfect, but more than anything else, I want to have a heart after you. My number one desire before making a million bucks, before getting on the cover of Time magazine, before anything is to have a heart for you. All those other things just kind of fall to the side when you have that. And when you do that, God strengthens you. God strengthens you. You're wondering why you're spiritually weak? It's not God's fault because he's sitting there waiting for you to commit. What do you want on your tombstone? What do you say to going forward to all out greatness in whatever you do? I've been telling you all about the Alpha Course, which we're going to be doing here on Tuesday nights. Um, it's a basic Christianity course and it's taught in an atmosphere of community. Did you know in the polls that they have right now that they're asking the younger generations what they want in church? Guess what it is? Community. They want to learn the Word of God, but they want to connect. They want community. So, so, we're going to be doing this class. I'll just tell you real quickly what it is. Uh, it's the very basics. Where do I go from here? Why do we have Jesus? What? These are all things that you have friends and maybe even some of you are just not real sure about. And here's the way it works. They're going to show up on a Tuesday night at six o'clock. We're going to give them a meal. We're going to have community. We're going to serve everybody that's there. We're going to, we're going to watch a 20 minute video and then we're going to sit around a table and we're going to talk. And hopefully somebody's going to ask the questions that they've always wanted to ask. There'll be people there to help you do that. There may be people that you need for that. And the series is actually a 15-week series. We're going to start off with a seven-week series and an end right before school is out. Who do you know that needs to know? Who do you know really needs to know about Jesus. And maybe it's you. Maybe you're not in a life group yet and you've never really connected with anybody here. This is going to be the great place to connect. Matter of fact, you know what I'm having, hoping is going to happen? I'm, gonna, I'm hoping that people that come out of this, we're going to turn into life groups. Wouldn't that be awesome? You'll automatically be connected to people that you know. But the number one thing now people are saying when they're looking at church, they're not looking for the preaching. They're not looking for the music. They're looking for people that they have something in common with. They're looking for community. We could use some more life group hosts. Golly, Royal, I, I can't teach the Bible. No, but you can cut pie. <laughs> you can have people come in. Here's how our, here's how our life group works. Our life group starts at 5.30. They get here. Uh, they walk in. The ladies go sit over here at the table. And the guys sit in the kitchen and we talk about whatever. There's no, there's all, all that's happening right now is community. We're getting to know each other. We're talking about life. We're talking about, we're making up things about how good we are. We're doing, we're doing all those other kind of things. And, and then the women are over here and then it, then it, no, we start at five and then at five 30, I blow the whistle and we go in the living room and then I lead the group. So in our life groups, we have people that host 
We need some host homes desperately to host about 10 to 12 people that come once a week and do community together while they learn and talk about the sermon and the things that we did for that week. You may just think, oh, I can host. That's something that I can do. But the other thing that's going to happen in this course that we're doing is we're going to have people that will be that will be leading the group and we'll find some people in that that will be anyway be thinking and praying about that because it's so important that it's so important that we have a relationship with each other in such a way that we can we can encourage each other to be the best we can possibly be see at the end of every life group there's question number 10 question number 10 is this what is one thing we can pray for you about today? Now, the reason that it's that one question is because this is how people usually do it. You got any prayer requests today? Yes, my aunt's dog is really struggling right now, and they've sent him to therapy, and I can't figure out why he's not getting better. And no, no, no. What's one thing we can pray for you? And it's really hard. It's real. I mean, think about it. If I was to ask you right now, what's one thing I could pray for you? You'd go, because uh, 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 one is you don't really want people to know what's going on in your life. But when you get in this relationship, so what happens is we write out the prayers, and then we send them out to the group. And the next week we go, hey, how'd that thing go? How'd that test go? Did you get that promotion? Are you, did you get that raise? And that becomes part of our community conversation. And then we go into our group and we, and we talk about what we learned that week from the message and, and discover with each other. Think about that. Can I just say, if you're interested in a life group at all and want to know more information, check interested in a life group. And I'll contact you. And I'm not going to force you to go to a life group or whatever, but any questions you have. And if you're interested in Alpha, it's seven weeks. It's going to run, I think we figured out, it's going to run from like 6 to 7.15, 7.30, probably closer to the other. Because like I said, the teaching is only about 20 minutes. The eating is only about 20 minutes. And there's a discussion part that goes with that. That was a lot of stuff. Huh? Hey, thank y'all for getting baptized today. Y'all, y'all made our... That might have encouraged somebody in here today who needs to be baptized. If you want information on that, check that on your Connect card. Let me pray, and then we'll have the announcements. Father, I just come before you this morning, and I'm so thankful for, for this group of people that you bring together to worship you. And Lord, I just pray that we leave here, we represent you well. I pray that we aspire to greatness. I pray that we're the best husband. I pray that we're the best wife. I pray that we're the best mother or father. I pray that we're the best employee. I pray, Lord, that because we give you all the glory, we become best at everything we do enough that people notice that there's something different about us. And I thank you for that. Lord, I pray today as we give of our tithes and offerings, Lord, that we, that we use those to, uh, to your glory. And I thank you for that. Lord, I pray for uh, this um, uh, meeting, this class that's coming up, Lord. I, I just pray for you to, to be in that. I pray, Lord, that we can reach our neighbors. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.